Into the Wild, Chapter 4, Detrital Wash. The desert is the environment of revelation, genetically and psychologically alien, sensory austere, aesthetically abstract, historically inimical. Its forms are bold and suggestive. The mind is beset by light and space, the kinesthetic novelty of aridity, high temperature, and wind. The desert sky is encircling, majestic, terrible. In other habitats, the rim of sky above the horizontal is broken or obscured. Here, together with the overhead portion, it is infinitely vaster than that of rolling countryside and forest lands. In an unobstructed sky, the clouds seem more massive, sometimes grandly reflecting the Earth's curvature on their concave undersides. The angularity of desert landforms imparts a monumental architecture to the clouds as well as to the land. To the desert go prophets and hermits, through deserts go pilgrims and exiles. Here, the leaders of the great religions have sought the therapeutic and spiritual values of retreat, not to escape, but to find reality. Paul Shepard, Man in the Landscape, a historic view of the aesthetics of nature. The bear paw poppy, Archotemicon californica, is a wildflower found in an isolated corner of the Mojave Desert and nowhere else in the world. In late spring, it briefly produces a delicate golden bloom, but for most of the year, the plant huddles unadorned and unnoticed on the parched earth. A californica is sufficiently rare that has been classified as an endangered species. In October 1990, more than three months after McCandless left Atlanta, a National Park Service ranger named Bud Walsh was sent to the backcountry of Lake Mead National Recreation Area to tally bear paw poppies so that the federal government might know just how scarce the plants were. A Californica grows only in gypsum soil of a sort that occurs in abundance along the south shore of Lake Mead. So that is where Walsh led his team of rangers to conduct the botanical survey. They turned off Temple Bar Road, drove two roadless miles down the bead of Detrital Wash, parked their rigs near the lake shore, and started scrambling up the steep east bank of the wash, a slope of crumbly white gypsum. A few minutes later, as they neared the top of the bank, one of the rangers happened to glance back down to the wash while pausing to catch his breath. Hey, look down there, he yelled. What the hell is that? At the edge of the dry riverbed, in a thicket of salt bush not far from where they had parked, a large object was concealed beneath a dun-colored tarpaulin. When the rangers pulled off the tarp, they found an old yellow Datsun without license plates. A note taped to the windshield read, This piece of shit has been abandoned. Whoever can get, a, get it out of here can have it. The doors had been left unlocked. The floorboards were plastered with mud, apparently from a recent flash flood. When he looked inside, Walsh found a Giannini guitar, a saucepan containing 493 and loose change, a football, a garbage bag full of old clothes, and a fishing rod and tackle, a new electric razor, a harmonica, a set of jumper cables, 25 pounds of rice, and in the glove compartment, the keys to the vehicle's ignition. The ranger searched the surrounding area for anything suspicious, according to Walsh, and then departed. Five days later, another ranger returned to the abandoned vehicle, managed to jumpstart it without difficulty, and drove it to the National Park Service maintenance yard at Temple Bar. He drove it back at 60 miles an hour, Walsh recalls, said the thing ran like a champ. Attempting to learn who owned the car, the ranger sent out a bulletin over the teletype to relevant law enforcement agencies and ran a detailed search of computer records across the southwest to see if the Datsun's VIN was associated to any crimes. Nothing turned up. By and by, the rangers traced the car's serial number to the Hertz Corporation. The vehicle's original owner, Hertz, said they had sold it as a used rental car many years earlier and had no interest in reclaiming it. Whoa, great, Walsh remembers, thinking, a freebie from the road gods. A car like this will make a great undercover vehicle for drug interdiction, and indeed it did. Over the next few years, the Park Service used the Datsun to make undercover drug buys that led to numerous arrests in the crime-plagued National Recreation Area. 
including the bust of a high-volume methamphetamine dealer operating out of a trailer near Bullhead City. We're still getting a lot of mileage out of that old car even now, Walsh proudly reports two and a half years later after finding the dat son. Put a few bucks of gas in the thing and it will go all day. Real reliable. I kind of wonder why nobody ever showed up to reclaim it. The dat son, of course, belonged to Chris McCandless. After piloting it west out of Atlanta, he arrived in Lake Mead National Recreation Area on June 6, riding a giddy Emersonian high, ignoring posted warnings of that off-road driving is strictly forbidden. McCandless steered the Datsun off the pavement where it crossed a broad, sandy wash. He drove two miles down the riverbed to the south shore of the lake. The temperature was 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The empty desert stretched into the distance, shimmering in the heat, surrounded by cholas, persage, and the comical scurrying of collared lizards. McCandless pitched his tent in the punny shade of a tamarisk and, bit and basked in his newfound freedom. Detrital Wash extends for some 50 miles from Lake Mead into the mountains north of Kingman. It drains a big chunk of country. Most of the year, the wash is as dry as chalk. During the summer months, however, superheated air rises from the scorched earth like bubbles from the bottom of a boiling kettle. Rushing heavenward in turbulent convection currents, frequently the updrafts create cells of muscular and bullheaded cumulumbious clouds that can rise 30,000 feet or more above the Mojave. Two days after McCandless set up camp beside Lake Mead, an unusually robust wall of thunderheads reared up into the afternoon sky, and it began to rain very hard over much of the detrital wash. McCandless was camped at the edge of the wash a couple of feet higher than the main channel, so when the boar of brown water came rushing down from the high country, he had just enough time to gather his tent and belongings and save them from being swept away. There was nowhere to move the car, however, as the only route of egress was now a foaming, full-blown river. As it turned out, the flash flood did not have enough power to carry away the vehicle or even do any lasting damage, but it did get the engine very wet. So wet that when McCandless tried to start the car thereafter, the engine wouldn't catch, and his impatience, he drained the battery. With the battery dead, there was no way to get the Datsun running. If he'd hoped to get the car back to the paved road, McCandless had no choice but to walk out and notify the authorities of his predicament. If he went to the rangers, however, they would have some irksome questions for him. Why had he ignored posted regulations and driven down the wash in the first place? Was he aware that the vehicle's registration had expired two years before and had not been renewed? Did he know that his driver's license was also expired and the vehicle was uninsured as well? Truthful responses to these queries were not likely to be well received by the rangers. McCandless would endeavor to explain that he answered to statues of a higher order, that as a latter-day adherent of Henry David Thoreau, he took a gospel of the essay on the duty of civil obedience, and thus considered it his moral responsibility to flout the laws of the state. It was improbable, however, that deputies of the federal government would share his point of view. There would be thickets of red tape to negotiate the fines to pay. His parents would no doubt be contract con contacted, but there was no way to avoid such aggravation. He could simply abandon the Datsun and resume his odyssey on foot and that's what he decided to do. Instead of feeling distraught over this turn of events more, more over, McCallis was exhilarated. He saw the flash flood as an opportunity to shed unnecessary baggage. He concealed the car as best as he could beneath the brown tarp, stripped it, stripped it of its Virginia plates, and hit them. He buried his Winchester deer hunting rifle and a few other possessions that he might one day want to recover. Then, in a gesture that would have done both Thoreau and Tolstoy proud, he arranged all his paper currency in a pile of sand, a pathetic little stacks of ones and fives and twenties, and put a match to it. One hundred twenty-three dollars in legal tender was promptly reduced to ash and smoke. We know all this because McCandless documented the burning of his money and most of the events that followed in a journal snapshot album that he would later leave with Wayne Westerberg 
for safekeeping before departing to Alaska. Although the tone of the journal written in the third person is a stilted, self-conscious voice, it often veers towards melodrama. The available evidence indicates that McCandless did not misrepresent the facts. Telling the truth was a credo he took very seriously. After loading the few remaining possessions into a backpack, McCandless set out on July 10th to hike around Lake Mead. This journal acknowledges turned out to be a tremendous mistake. In extreme July, temperatures become delirious. Suffering from heat strokes, he managed to flag down some passing boaters who gave him a lift to Calville Bay, a marina near the west end of the lake, where he stuck out his thumb and took the road. McCandless tramped around the west for the next two months, spellbound by the scale and power of the landscape, thrilled by minor brushes with the law savoring the intermittent company of other vagabonds he met on the way. Allowing his life to be shaped by circumstance, he hitched to Lake Tahoe, hiked the Sierra Nevada, and spent a week walking north on the Pacific Crest Trail before exiting the mountains and returning to the pavement. At the end of July, he accepted a ride from a man who called himself Crazy Ernie and offered McCandless a job on a ranch in Northern California. Photographs of the place show an unpainted, tumble-down house surrounded by goats and chickens, bed springs, broken television, shopping carts, old appliances, and mounds and mounds of garbage. After working there 11 days with six other vagabonds, it became clear to McCandless that Ernie had no intention of ever paying him, so he stole the red 10-speed bicycle from the clutter in the yard, pedaled into Chico, and ditched the bike in a mall parking lot. Then he resumed a life of constant motion, riding his thumb north and west through Red Bluff, Weaverville, and Willow Creek. At Arctica, California, in the dripping redwood forest of the Pacific Shore, McCandless turned right on U.S. Highway 101 and headed up the coast. Six miles south of the Oregon line near the town of Oric, a pair of drifters in an old van pulled over to consult their map when they noticed a boy crouching in the bushes off the side of the road. He was wearing long shorts and this really stupid hat, said Jan Burris, a 41-year-old rubber tramp who was traveling around the rest selling knickknacks at flea markets and swap meets with her boyfriend, Bob. He had a book about plants with him, and he was using it to pick berries, collecting them in a gallon milk jug with the top cut off. He looked pretty pitiful, so I yelled, Hey, you want to ride somewhere? I thought maybe we could give the kid a meal or something. We got talking. He was a nice kid, said his name was Alex, and he was big time hungry. Hungry, hungry, hungry. But real happy, said he had been surviving on edible plants he identified from the book. Like he was really proud of it, said he was tramping around the country, having a big old adventure. He told us about abandoning his car, about burning all his money. I said, why would you do that? Claimed he didn't need money. I have the son about the same age Alex was, and we've been estranged for a few, a few years now. So I said to Bob, man, we got to take care of this kid. We need to school him about some things. Alex took a ride from us up to Oric Beach, where we were staying, and camped with us for a week. He was a really good kid. We thought the world of him. When he left, we never expected to hear from him again, but he made a point of staying in touch for the next two years. Alex sent us a postcard every month or two. From Oric, McCandless continued north up the coast. He passed through Pistol River, Coos Bay, Seal Rock, Manzanita, Astoria, Hoquiam, Hump Tulips, Queets, Forks, Port Angeles, Fort Townsend, Seattle. He was alone, as James Joyce wrote of Stephen Dadalus, he his artist as a young man. He was unheeded happy and near to the wild heart of life. He was alone and young and willful and wild-hearted, alone amid a waste of wild air and brackish waters and the sea harvest of shells and tangle and veiled gray sunlight. On August 10th, shortly before meeting Jan Burrs and Bob, McCandless had been ticketed for hitchhiking near Willow Creek in the gold mining country east of Eureka. In an un 
characteristic lapse. McCandless gave his parents Annandale, his Annandale, Annandale address when the arresting officer demanded to know his permanent place of residence. The unpaid ticket appeared in Walt and Billy's mailbox at the end of August. Walt and Billy, terribly concerned over Chris's vanishing act, had by that time already contacted the Annandale police, who had been of no help. When the ticket arrived from California, they became frantic. One of their neighbors was the director of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, and Walt approached this man, an army general, for advice. The general put him in touch with a private investigator named Peter Kalitka, who had done contract work for both the DIA and the CIA. He was the best. The general assumed, assured Walt if Chris was out there, Kalitka would find him. Using the Willow Creek ticket as a starting point, Kalitka launched an extremely thorough search, chasing down leads that led as far afield as Europe and South Africa. His efforts, however, turned up nothing until December, when he learned from an inspection of tax records that Chris had given, given away his college fund to Oxfam. That really scared us, said Walt. By that point, we had absolutely no idea that Chris, what Chris could be up to. The hitchhiking ticket just didn't make any sense. He loved that Datsun so much, it was mind-boggling to me that he would ever abandon it and travel on foot. Although, in retrospect, I guess it, should have been, it shouldn't have surprised me. Chris was, Chris was very much of the school that you should own nothing except what you can carry on your back at the dead run. As Kalitka was trying to pick up Chris's set in California, McCallis was already far away, hitching east of the Cascade Range across the sagebrush upland and lava beads beds of the Columba River Basin across the Idaho Panhandle into Montana. There, outside Cutbank, he crossed paths with Wayne Westerberg, and by the end of September, he was working for him in Carthage. When Westerberg was jailed and the work came to a halt, and with winter coming on, McCandless headed for warmer climates. On October 28th, he caught a ride with a long-haul trucker into Needles, California. Overjoyed upon reaching the Colorado River, McCandless wrote in his journal, then he left the highway and started walking south towards the desert, following the river bank. Twelve miles on foot brought him to Topak, Arizona, a dusty way station along Interstate 40, where the freeway intersects the California border. While he was in town, he noticed a second-hand aluminum canoe for sale, and, an, and on an um, impulse decided to buy it and paddle it down the Colorado River to the Gulf of California nearly 400 miles to the south, across the border with Mexico. This lower stretch of the river from Hoover Dam to the Gulf has little in common with the unbridled torrent that explodes through the Grand Canyon. Some 250 miles upstream from Topak, emasculated by dams and diversion canals, the lower Colorado burbles indolently from reservoir to reservoir through some of the hottest, darkest country in the continent. McCandless was stirred by the austerity of this landscape, by its saline beauty. The desert sharpened the sweet ache of his longing, amplified it, gave shape to it in, in sere geology and clean slant of light. From Topak, McCandless paddled down south to Lake Havasu under a bleached dome of sky, huge and empty. He made a brief excursion up the Bill Williams River, a tributary of the Colorado, Colorado, then continued downstream through the Colorado River Indian Reservation. The Cibola National Wildlife Refuge, the Imperial National Wildlife Refuge, he drifted past Saguaros Sagu, and Alkali Flats, camped beneath escarpments of naked Precambrian stone. In the distance, spiky chocolate brown mountains floated on eerie pools of myrrh. Leaving the river for a day to track a herd of wild horses, he came across a sign warning that he was trespassing on the U.S. Army's highly restricted Yuma proving ground. McCallus was returned not in the least. At the end of November, he paddled through Yuma, where he stopped long enough to replenish his provisions 
and send a postcard to Westerberg in care of Glory House, the Seox Falls work release facility where Westerberg was doing time. Hey Wayne, the card reads, How's it going? I hope that your situation has improved since the last time we spoke. It's been tramping, I've been tramping around Arizona for about a month now. This is a good state. There's all kinds of fantastic scenery and the climate is wonderful. But apart from sending greetings, the main purpose of this card is to thank you once again for all your hospitality. It's rare to find a man as generous and good natured as you are. Sometimes I wish I hadn't met you. Tramping is too easy with all this money. My days were more exciting when I was penniless and had to forge around for my next meal. I could make it now without the money. I couldn't make it now without the money. However, as there is very little fruiting agriculture down here at this time. Please thank Kevin again for all the clothes he gave me. I would have froze to death without them. I hope he got that book to you. Wayne, you should really read War and Peace. I mean to I mean it when I say that you had one of the highest characters of any man I'd ever met. That it's a very powerful and highly symbolic book. It has things in it that I think you will understand. Things that escape most people. As for me, I've decided that I'm going to live this life for some time to come. The freedom and simple beauty of it is just too good to pass up. One day I'll get back to you, Wayne, and repay you for your kindness. A case of Jack Daniels, maybe? Till then, I'll always think of you as a friend. God bless you, Alexander. On December 2nd, he reached the Morales Dam in the Mexican border. Worried that he would be denied entry because he was carrying no identification, he sneaked into Mexico by paddling through the dam's open floodgates and shooting into the spillway below. Alec looks quickly around for signs of trouble, his journal records, but his entry of Mexico is either unnoticed or ignored. Alexand Alexander is jubilant. His jubilance, however, was short-lived. Below, below the Morelos Dam, the river turns into a maze of irrigation canals, marshland, and dead-end channels, among which McCandless repeatedly lost his way. Canals break off in a multitude of directions. Alex is dumbfounded. Dumbfounded encounters some canal officials who can speak a little English. They tell him he has not been traveling south, but west, and is headed for the center of the Baja Peninsula. Alex is crushed, pleads, and persists that there may be some waterway to the Gulf of California. They stare at Alex and think him crazy, but then a passionate conversation breaks out amongst them. Accompanied by maps and the flourish of pencils, after 10 minutes, they present to Alex a route which apparently will take him to the ocean. He is overjoyed and hope bursts back into his heart. Following the map, he reverses back up the canal until he comes upon the Canal de Independencia, which he takes east. According to the map, this canal should, should bisect the Welteco Canal, which will turn south and flow all the way to the ocean. But his hopes are quickly smashed when the canal comes to a dead end in the middle of the desert. A, re a reconnaissance mission reveals, however, that Alex has merely run back into the bed of the now dead and dry Colorado River. He discovers another canal about a half mile on the other side of the riverbed. He decides to portage to this canal. It took McCallus most of three days to carry the canoe and his gear to the new canal. The journal entry for December 5th records, at last, Alex finds what he believes to be the Well Taco Canal and heads south. Worries and fears return as the canal grows ever smaller. Local inhabitants help him portage around a barrier. Alex finds Mexicans to be warm, friendly people, much more hospitable than Americans. The six, small but dangerous waterfalls litter the canal. The ninth, all hopes collapse. The canal does not reach the ocean, but merely petters out into the vast swamp. Alex is utterly confounded and decides he must be close to ocean and elects to try and work a way through swamp to sea. Alex becomes progressively lost to a point where he must push canoe through reeds and drag it through mud. All is in despair. Find some dry ground to camp in swamp at sundown. Next day, on the 10th, 
Alex resumes quest for an opening to the sea, but only becomes more confused, traveling in circles. Completely demoralized and frustrated, he lays in his canoe at day's end and weeps. But then, by fantastic chance, he comes upon American duck hunting guides who can speak English. He tells them his story and his quest for the sea. They say there is no outlet to the sea, but then one among them agrees to tow Alex back to his base camp behind a small motor skiff and drive him and the canoe in the bed of a pickup truck to the ocean. It is a miracle. The duck hunters dropped him in El Golfo de Santa Clara, a fishing village of the Gulf of California. From there, McCandless took to the sea, traveling south down the eastern edge of the Gulf. Having reached his destination, McCandless slowed his pace, and his mood became more contemplative. He took photographs of a tarantula, plaintive sunsets, wine-swept dunes, and the long curve of empty coastline. The journal entries become short and perfunctory. He wrote fewer than a hundred words over the month that followed. On December 14th, weary of paddling, he hauled the canoe far up the beach, climbed a sandstone bluff, and set up camp on the edge of a desolate plateau. He stayed there for ten days until high winds forced him to seek refuge in a cave midway up the precipitous face of the bluff, where he remained for another ten days. He greeted the the new year by observing the full moon as it rose over the Gran Desierto, the Great Desert. 1,700 square miles of shifting, shifting dune, the largest expanse of pure sand desert in North America. A day later, he resumed paddling down the barren shore. His journal entry for January 11, 1991, begins a very fateful day. After traveling some distance south, he beached the canoe on a sandbar far from the shore to observe the powerful tides. An hour later, violent gusts started blowing down from the desert, and the wind and tidal rips conspired to carry him out to sea. The water, by this time, was a chaos of white, white caps that threatened to swamp and capsize his tiny craft. The wind increased to gale force. The white caps grew into high breaking waves. In great frustration, the journal reads, he screams and beats canoe with oar. The oar breaks. Alex has one spare oar. He calms himself.